I'm happy to uh, welcome Dr. Rob Imre. He has an uh, interdisciplinary background in many fields, ranging from uh, studies in terrorist movements over comparative education systems uh, down to social media and government usage. And he is uh, currently um, at the University of Newcastle in Australia, not England, and uh, visiting fellow of the University of Tampere. Please uh, welcome Dr. Rob Imre, who will talk about mediatization and capitalization of the surveillance assemblage. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, Tom Pere. That's how you say it? Sorry? Tom Pere. Tom Pere. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that's how you pronounce it, Tom Pere. Ah, I'm Come sorry. Come on, you got it. Tom Pere. Okay. <laughs> the, the fiends yeah. always tell me i got to pronounce their things right, so i got to do it. Uh, this is a conceptual paper too, so I'm quite happy to to have this uh, uh, previous paper because I I think that sometimes um, uh, we forget that academics will ground their work in in conceptual notions, and so this is what we have to do. Uh, it frames where we are going politically. It frames where we are situated globally and historically. So. We must do this, and, and so my own paper here is, is also a conceptual one. Um, so I'll summarize my ideas here, and then, and then the same sort of thing, uh, take some questions at the end, and I do want to add a couple of qualifiers really before I begin. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a political scientist, uh, and that's my, that's my uh, area of training. Um, so my, I have a number of research projects that I run, and and uh, with colleagues as well as on my own. And so uh, this sort of conceptual stuff is always, there's an iterative process, right? We go back and forth and we find the information and find the data and run the research projects and come back and redo our conceptualizations and so on. So this is grounded in reality, uh, even though it may not seem like it's grounded in reality uh, when we do these, these sorts of uh, uh, conceptual things. Uh, I think that uh, um, listening to the questions from the, the last paper, I think that uh, you're asking the wrong questions. So uh, to be a, you know, a proper obnoxious academic, I'm going to tell you all you're asking the wrong questions. I think that we are well and truly beyond uh, these sorts of things that we're worried about when we're worried about uh, uh, privacy, when we're worried about these uh, uh, concepts around data and big data and things, I think that we are well beyond where some of your questions are coming from. And I'll try and show you what I'm talking about here. Um, I think that actually Snowden is, is the end and not the beginning. Uh, so let me get into this and talk about this. And I'll, I'm conscious of time, so I'll try and get through this quickly. I think that uh, th it's a good demarcation to use when we talk about post-Snowden. I think. Uh, um, where we consider ourselves to be, especially in terms of global security and terrorism. Uh, th I think that these, uh, my reaction and some of my colleagues who are also political scientists, our reactions to some of the, this stuff around Snowden and these leaks is simply to say, so what? Uh, this actually doesn't tell us anything. This is the end point of a long process rather than the beginning of something new. We already knew this was happening. The Five Eyes structure has been going on for a long time. Uh, the, the UK, the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada have cooperated on this type of surveillance for a long time. So none of this is really new. Some of the specifics are interesting because we do have these things coming out, this sort of the WikiLeaks stuff and Snowden stuff. Uh, fine. Some of the specifics are interesting, but whether, whether or not this is new, I don't think so. I think it's, this is the end point. Um, and then, of course, there's a whole bunch of questions here, right? Should we be worried? Well, I don't know if we should be worried or not, and I'll get to some of the, the, the uh, uh, semi-answers to this, and I hope that people start to think about this when we, uh, when we go on with this conference and talk more about this. So should we be worried? I don't know. Uh, I, I think a big question is to ask whether or not this is a fundamental change in the way that we think about 
concepts that we use all the time, like rights and accountability and democracy and freedom and so on. So I think the big set of questions is whether or not this has created a fundamental change. So do we actually now have a different kind of democracy than we would have had uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago or right at the end of the, of the Second World War? Now, of course, to, I, I, I uh, uh, will presage my own answers and, and say that I do think actually we have a different quality of democracy. There's a different kind of democracy and a different way that political leaders are assuming that their roles are supposed to be played. So I, you know, I can answer that question uh, immediately and say, yes, I, th I think we do. And I think that these concepts do have to be redone and rethought. Um, but then there's another level, of, of course. Should we care about this? Should we even care? Does this present us with a problem? Again, this sort of political science question that I like to ask, so what? If this is the case, or are there strategies to deal with this? What might be some of these strategies? How do we go about doing this? Some of this has to do with uh, technological design, and, and I, of course, will have to raise the, uh, uh, the example in, in Germany, and a great deal was made about the, the uh, uh, surveillance of, of uh, the chancellor and the telephone calls and, and all this sort of stuff. But my, I, just, I want to make this point about technological design and a number of things that we've, we've seen in, in recent years. Um, the monitoring equipment, and the, which leads into these problems with big data and so on, has, has at least two problems. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to not collect data. So it's almost impossible to kind of uh, cast a net and then say, well, we're going to make an exception for the chancellor and we'll make an exception for this ministry and that ministry. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult to do that. Uh, so these, this is why I say these questions about privacy and what it is that democracies ought to be doing and accountability and so on, I think they're, they're now reconceptualized. Um, the sheer amount of this metadata also changes what it is that we are doing. So the sheer amount of these, these uh, uh, calculations st still provide this kind of big surveillance structure which which we like to call, you know, ac academics and my colleagues, we like to uh, label things and add various jargon so we can create our own language. And this is what we call the surveillance assemblage. So uh, inside this surveillance assemblage, it will always be provided with enough data to deliver this information so that we can continue to, to surveil. So this really turns into an impossible situation. This is what I mean by this surveillance uh, assemblage. The first question is, of course, do we have one, or am I just crazy and paranoid? Uh, I think we do have a surveillance assemblage. I, I'm not saying I'm not crazy, but uh, we do have a surveillance assemblage. Uh, I've talked about this. I've talked about this in previous publications I've done, where how we have a particular architecture of this technology, uh, how it's been built, and, and where we are today. Um, a number of things we have to keep in mind, the building of this architecture, the building of this surveillance assemblage is sometimes random, sometimes by design, sometimes accidental, uh, sometimes planned, and sometimes really just a big mix of all of these things. So if you look at the way that, that public policy is made, if you look at the way that governments react to uh, various so-called security threats and things like that, th it becomes clear that uh, it is not always logical, it is sometimes random, it is sometimes uh, uh, accidental and so on. And the assemblage can actually consist of a number of different points of contact and that ensures that people and their environments are, are constantly and almost always under some kind of scrutiny. So this is the world that we live in. So this is why I say if this surveillance assemblage exists, uh, we, really, we really are asking the wrong questions. I'll just quickly go into this uh, uh, couple of conceptual things about mediatization and capitalization, and then I'll start getting crazy with uh, a gambin and talking about what biopolitics is doing. Um, media, mediatization us, usually refers to these several different intertwined concepts. Uh, I talk about the way that media shapes human interactions. So um, 
there's a way to think about this. There's a way to think about how uh, political process relies on the media. Mediatiza mediatization, to put it quite simply, really means a uh, constant and regular framing by the media and the structures of this, whatever we call the media, in our everyday interactions. So if we think about how social media is used, if we think about how people will prefer to post various things online uh, before they even kind of register it in, the, in their own minds, that's what mediatization means. And for political scientists, it means the framing of political communication inside some kind of media construct. Now, uh, at the end of at the end of my talk, in just a few minutes, I'll get to these uh, a few of these points about how we might change how we do mediatization, or we might change how we think about uh, uh, even this concept of social media, um, and then uh, uh, kind of allude to resistance strategies or something like this. When we talk about capitalization, it refers to a number of these enmeshed problems. It means that there's a constant data set that's being made subject to processes of buying and selling. So, so uh, coupling capitalization with mediatization brings us into a particular type of, of architecture that we, we live in. So it refers to this idea that finance and the monetary construct is, is increasingly linked to this data. Data becomes this special kind of commodity. So we're using this special kind of commodity. Uh, it's real and not real at the same time. So at the same time, the data is, is and, I'll, and at the end of this, I'll tell you how to make it even more unreal, but uh, data is real and, and not real at the same time. It can be sold, stolen, uh, but it's not necessarily something practical and tangible and, and things like that. But it certainly is a kind of commodity. There's a number of implications that we, we talk about um, and when we deal with political violence and these sorts of things as well. The commodification of data means that, that people can just buy these things. Uh, terrorists of various kinds probably in the near future will not need complex weapons. We won't talk about the propaganda of the deed in the same way as we do today. In the future, simply purchasing data sets will be able to actually set political violence on a different course. We'll be able to set political violence on this pathway where uh, <coughs> chaos can be caused in a functionally different way. So in security terms, it defines what security actually means. Is it personal individual security we're talking about or is it really something else? And I think it seems to be the case that once we have these data sets, we can steal them or purchase them, we can kind of move them around then I think our, our, our questions about security and our questions about even uh, human individuality, which I want to get to in a moment, are, are changing quite rapidly. Let me talk about uh, uh, biopolitics for a little bit. And, and this is, again, you know, this might be getting into a, a bit of academic jargon, so I'm very happy to have people uh, uh, ask questions about this and talk about this later on as well. Uh, this, I use this concept of biopolitics in, in some of my work and I want to situate questions of, of terrorism and political violence and security and uh, where we are going in terms of this type of communication. I want to situate that here. Um, as a political science term, it has a number of meanings. So it's not a singular meaning. It has a number of meanings and I'm going to end up situating a particular meaning of this in a kind of dystopic frame uh, and then that's when people are going to think I'm really gone off the edge and, and a little bit paranoid. Uh, Foucault is the, is the viewed as this kind of originator of the concept, but it goes back a little bit further than that. There's a divide where if we use this term biopolitics, uh, American social scientists started talking about this in, in terms of um, uh, simply attaching biology to the political. And even today, what that simply means is to uh, think about how people use, for example, voting patterns and then attach that to some kind of uh, sets of genetic components. So, believe it or not, there are studies that say uh, people with certain kinds of genetic predispositions are more likely to vote in a particular way. It's a very American way of doing political science and frankly I hate it. Uh, I actually think it's crap, but, uh, and I've said this publicly, I've said it uh, 
But you do, you know, when you're an academic, you do have to acknowledge that it exists. It's crap, but it exists, and so we have to say that. I like the biopolitics uh, side that talks about, originates in Foucault, and then I like uh, Giorgio Agamben's redoing of this, which I, I want to uh, end up in because it, it is properly crazy, which I, I like much more than the, uh, this very boring American version. So let's broaden this uh, focus a little bit. Um, uh, Gambin redoes Foucault's ideas. Uh, he takes this a little bit further, especially to, we can use this, especially when we talk about emerging technologies. Uh, it deals with this problem of linking the modern nation state and identity commodification, because the data sets are about identity commodification. They are almost functionally about, you know, and again, my paranoid vision, they are almost functionally about taking individuals and sucking them into some kind of a matrix where your biological condition actually becomes secondary to your uh, data set condition. So, you know, I know this is sounding very science fictionary, uh, science fictiony, and things like that. Um, uh, I became addicted to science fiction when I was a 12 year old and never got, never got rid of my addiction. Uh, so I think that uh, it really has affected me. So I have to be honest about my, about my madnesses, right? Uh, the body politic and this kind of neoliberal embodied individual is where we are at, I think, in terms of a, uh, a kind of a historical thing. I like Agamben's stuff because he's repeatedly claimed that uh, in contemporary politics it's, it's more and more difficult to act politically. It's more and more because of the way that current democracies have shaped and framed themselves in this really, in this kind of uh, uh, post 9-11 era. So the Cold War finishes and then after 9-11, everyone gets really paranoid and the governments claim that we are in some kind of state of emergency. And then this is a Gambin's, again, the crux of, of uh, what well, one part of a Gambin's theory anyway, is that we are in this state of emergency. So uh, that means that individual bodies then become subject to the state in a completely different manner, right? If you're in a constant state of emergency, this is what happens. Uh, I've monitored, uh, with uh, another colleague of mine, we've monitored a set of elections, and in that set of elections, we've monitored national elections as well as uh, Canadian, provincial, and um, uh, where else? State elections, somewhere else. Now I can't remember. It was a large study. Anyway, uh, you get the idea. We monitored these elections over the, the uh, course of about four years, a little bit more than four years, and almost exclusively with, I think, two exceptions. There was one election that was just recently run in Canada, in Ontario, that did not use uh, this concept of the state of emergency. Almost without exception, we see this, we, that's how elections are run. So this is a kind of a, a new trend that, that has happened. Um, I think in the post 9-11 period. In fact, the, uh, the last, uh, really a fascinating thing, because, well, for you know, political scientists, it might be very boring for everyone here, but uh, a fascinating thing happened with the Australian, recent Australian federal election, and that thing was that there was a, uh, the world's best solution to what had happened with the, the recent stock market crash was apparently in Australia. So there's a kind of a law about elections and running ele elections that if you have a well-functioning economy and you know, there's this kind of middle-class welfare that goes on and if people are doing well in this kind of middle-class structure, then uh, the ruling party will win the election. It's a kind of an unwritten rule in, in political science when we look at elections. And of course this doesn't happen in Australia because the Australian government said we are in a state of emergency and they continually said this. There was no threat, there was no e economic threat, there was no military threat, there wasn't anything like this but they worked very, very hard to develop a political campaign to say uh, we're in a state of emergency. You have to trust us. You can't trust any of these, these uh, uh, left-wing governments because they don't know how to handle these emergencies. You need strong leadership and so on and so forth. You know, this kind of uh, messiah complex was developed. And so uh, I think liberal democracies all over the world have, have done this. I think that uh, uh, this kind of political process has, has become legitimate. It's the legitimate idea that the sovereign has to exercise special power 
And that special power no longer needs to be something that is, is you know, accountable to, to the electorate or something like that. It's a special power. So then we layer technology and the technological self and the media over this, and how do they play these interacting roles here? So this is the question that we, we ask. And this is where this concept of biopolitics comes in, because then we start to talk about uh, the power over life. So Foucault's concept was this concept in, in terms of biopolitics. Foucault's concept was this idea that uh, it is about the power over life. And then Agamben does this and changes this uh, uh, a little bit later and says, well, actually, biopolitics is also about the power over, over death. So Agamben says something a little bit different. Um, so I've talked about this in, in uh, you know, I have some of my recent work. I've talked about this sort of stuff about uh, uh, how structural change, how technology actually guarantees nothing because there is this, there is this assumption and I constantly have to uh, raise this at, at <coughs> academic conferences as well as other types of discussions. I constantly have to raise this, this technological determinism and sort of knock that on its head. It is not the case that just because we can all use Twitter that all of a sudden society becomes more open and free. It is not the case. And so, but you can't just say that you have to go and prove that. So if we go back to, to looking at what happens in Ukraine and Egypt when these particular types of revolutions occur, we can actually clearly see that it doesn't take long for the sovereign to now declare a state of emergency and then just tweet everybody and say, you better get out of the square where, that, where you're having this demonstration because we know you're there because we've geolocated you and we're coming to get you. So this happened a couple of times in, in Ukraine, happened a couple of times in Egypt, and really interesting how, how uh, the political process can be subverted like this and, and, and it becomes very, very difficult to, uh, to act against the sovereign. So this idea that social media is guaranteeing freedom of some kind uh, is often assumed, uh, and again, it's another one of these things, just to make a long story short, I think it's crap, it's garbage. There's no way that that's happening. Um, I use this concept of hegemony. I've got a slide here that's, uh, see, Mac does this sometimes. I use this concept of he hegemony to talk about democracies around the world, and this is what my point is about having liberal democracies, having liberal democracies uh, move towards this kind of right-wing reactionary governance. And this is, this is the type of thing that they're doing. Now, I, I, oh, it worked. I had a slide come up that was very strange. OK. Um, so I think that politics and the political is faced with these two big challenges. Uh, one is technology, and technological design is limited by this, this, this thing that we call prosumption that pushes choice onto the consumer in a, in a particular way. The assumption that interaction with capitalism is the same as political participation. So uh, we see this all the time. We see this with liberal democracies. They assume that interacting with a capitalist structure is immediately going to mean that we are participating and that's all we need. So liberal democracies around the world then say, uh, all you need to do is have an access to a, some form of, of market, some form of capitalism, and the rest of the stuff we can step back from, and then we go back to my previous points about state of emergency and so on, and that's, that's how this seems to be construed in uh, recent times. So politics itself becomes viewed as this, this producer-consumer nexus. It stops being politics, and it starts being this kind of uh, marketization. And so we surveil each other. This is this surveillance idea that we're, it's actually a surveillance from below. We're watching each other. So not only are we only participating in the market and not being part of real politics, but we're watching each other to make sure that uh, everybody's out uh, doing the, the kind of thing that they, they should be doing. So this surveillance stuff guarantees that individuals will feed this uh, uh, social media structure with this endless stream of data. And so I think that in, a, uh, in what I think we would call a, a kind of a post-bureaucratic state, it's not really necessary anymore for states to set up these, these complex surveillance systems. It, this isn't how it's going to be working. Uh, it's only necessary to mine data. We already monitor each other. We already monitor each other on various forms of social media. We already monitor each other for uh, 
uh, in terms of how people use mobile phones, and all we need to do is mine that data. The quicker we mine it, the quicker we know what people are doing and so on. So it's kind of a uh, dystopic uh, structure that we're, we're getting at. I think that the progressive online migration of political institutions changes these, these power relationships completely, changes these concepts of security completely. Uh, the power relationships I'm talking about are structural as, as well as theoretical, and this is why I think it, it raises a whole bunch of questions about political agency, about authenticity, about participation, and so on. And it, you know, it, this is why I think that, that uh, Snowden and the, the post-Snowden period, if we want to frame it that way, this is why I think that Snowden is the end point. Because uh, if we're all monitoring each other, if we're all looking at each other, if the sovereign can act anyway because there's a state of emergency, then what's there to be leaked? There really isn't anything to be leaked anymore. That's, I don't know. I mean, we can argue about this, but uh, that's what I think. Uh, so let me finish up here. Just two more slides and we're done. Uh, I, think that, uh, there, I think that there is a kind of a dystopia to, to come, but I don't think it's this neoliberal thing. See, I think that we've been complaining about neoliberalism for a long time. Certainly uh, in academic circles, we've been complaining about this for a long time. We created a neoliberal subject, and then we uh, created these personality structures that fit into this thing. We created a version of neoliberalism and legitimated this uh, in, in the ways that we, we interact politically. Um, but I think we're beyond that. I think that uh, uh, we're so far beyond that these concepts, even concepts of best practice, are, are determined by a particular kind of choice rather than expertise. Uh, responsibility has already disappeared in, into the marketplace. And I think that there's a, a clear hegemony that's happening here. So this is a kind of a dystopia. And, and Agamben's view of biopolitics, in fact, has taken this quite far and said that, uh, you know, Agamben's thing is that modernity and the modern period is deeply imbued with the logic of the concentration camps. So he claims that there's a particular logic, and that particular logic means that uh, certain people are marked for death. We know that there are certain people that will not live past the age of 40. Uh, there's about a billion people on the planet that will probably not live past the age of 40. Um, they have no way of getting out of that. Uh, and this is Gambon's worry. You know, he says that they, they are permanently tattooed. And his logic to this. He even he refuses to travel to the United States because he refuses to give up his own bio data because, of course, you travel to the U.S. and you've got to be fingerprinted and, and uh, uh, he doesn't want to be tattooed in that way. So he has this real kind of um, uh, uh, negative view of, of, of how this technology is operating and how it's working. Well, uh, are there ways out? I mean, these are the questions you always have to ask about dystopia, right? And when I, I run a bunch of courses on uh, um, uh, various courses on international relations and political science and how this, one of my favorite courses is a, is a, is a course on global terrorism. Uh, I, I can actually run through this historically and then talk about this and how, how uh, uh, people can interact with the state and things like that. Um, since we all get sucked into these, these various data machines. I, I often tell my students that you really should lie more. You should lie as much as you possibly can. We are, surveil we are surveilled. Uh, we are examined in, in all sorts of different ways. And, you know, I'm not going to list how many... You can just create this gigantic list of how this sur surveillance operates. And, uh, what, what, you know, one of the things I don't understand is I don't understand why people are... are in any way honest with the surveillance structure. I, I don't understand this at all. Um, you really should be switching identities. You really should be moving around your data, deleting things, getting rid of it, starting over, you know, doing this. I know it sounds crazy, but uh, uh, if you ask about if there are ways out, well, these are, you know, helpful ways in, in making those data sets redundant because that's one way to get rid of this is to make the data set completely redundant. There, you know, you can list your hobbies and lie. Just make something up. And then the data set becomes redundant, right? So this is the kind of thing that, uh, that we think about. Uh, 
so these these sorts of so this is why I think we're in a different place. I think that these sorts of things and the way that we are conceptualizing security and thinking about how how security operates today is in a is in a different place. Uh, but I think if we talk about Snowden, Snowden is the end point and rather than rather than the beginning. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, and I'll take questions. So, any questions? Uh, just a short remark for our German speakers. Um, wenn ihr Fragen auf Deutsch stellen wollt, uh, könnt ihr das tun. Dann wird sie Andreas kurz übersetzen und dann werden sie nachher beantwortet. Right. Any questions? Hello, Gilles Baudelaire here. Um, uh, you mentioned Snowden basically being an endpoint. So I'm looking at this from a historical perspective. I guess you're talking about end of an era, beginning of a new one. So how would you define those? Is I mean, you already mentioned 9/11 um, being the end of the Cold War um, era. So what was in between, and what's what's coming? How would you define those? Well, I, I don't know what's coming. I have no idea. I, it doesn't look very good, though. Uh, but I think that uh, um, from, from what I can tell as a political scientist, if I examine how uh, liberal democracies have converged into a singular kind of, of set of democratic practices, I think that that's where we are. What I mean by that is to say we are really in this, this post-neoliberal state. So uh, I think we're in a set of circumstances where uh, uh, politics is run and done in a particular way and we can't really provide any sort of resistance to that. Now, um, if I try and characterize this in a particular way, I would say that uh, the Occupy movements tried in some way to challenge that neoliberal or post-neoliberal structure of the state. They tried to challenge that. And I wrote an article about this. And what I found interesting was that um, uh, a number of people really criticized the, the Occupy movements. And they criticized the Occupy movements because uh, they claimed that it was almost impossible to know what they wanted. So people really didn't make claims like old sorts of claims were made about voting rights or about you know, specific structural changes or something like that. It was just this uh, um, broad-based concept where people said, we don't want politics to be done like this anymore. We want it to be changed. But there were no specific things. So maybe we are in somewhere so new that like the Occupy movements, we don't really know what it is that we all want. We don't really know how to go about changing all these things. We don't really know how to escape this uh, uh, all-pervasive nexus that exists. We don't know how to escape this thing about security, that we have to have some kind of absurd security apparatus that locks everything down. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I should have just said that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have an another question. I think you, you addressed the fact that Politicians, especially the ruling ones, have basically given up on politics um, and are more slave to well, what the economical system is doing. Um, is this... I've always wondered about this construct because I'm not sure whether it is... Um, I mean, you could go the, um, the conspiracy the theory way and say, well, they're all bought. Mm. Or you could be maybe more pragmatical and say, well, they're all suffering the pressure from the street for more jobs, for better living conditions, so they sacrifice everything for better economy data. Um, what do you think is the case? And do you think there is maybe a way out of this to go back to politics that actually define the way we live so that we have something to vote for? Yes, I, I agree entirely. I think that this is, uh, uh, this is the great failing of recent politics. So the great failing of, of uh, really, I think, post 9-11 politics. So from the end of the Cold War, uh, then we have this big set of catastrophes with this particular type of terrorism. And I think because of that, um, political leaders around the world gave up, as you say, completely gave up on politics. 
And so it isn't a contest of ideas anymore. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think it's a conspiracy theory because having spoken to a number of politicians and policymakers, I don't think they're smart enough to actually have a you know, grand conspiracy. Uh, so that's not going to work. But uh, I think they have fallen into this trap of uh, not making it about politics. And th this is really difficult because in order to make this about politics, then that is precisely what you would want to ask your political leaders or that's precisely how you would want to get involved in politics is you would want to say that uh, I, this is the type of society I want to live in and, and I want it to be an open society and I want to have you know, more bicycle paths or whatever it is that you want. But it's not about that in any way. It's, it's simply about a uh, uh, struggle for power and grabbing the power inside the, the actual power structure. And that's why we create this state of exception, the state of emergency, and we just move into the power structure. So none of the, you know, if you want to say real issues, none of the real issues are ever uh, part of these election campaigns anymore. They, they, certainly the surveys that I've done show me this. So I, I don't know, again, I don't know how to go back to politics. Maybe that's what we need to do, somehow press political leaders to, to demand that they go back to politics. But you know, this is the same, this is the same issue as um, um, uh, this big problem with, with uh, journalism. So the big problem with journalism in particular, uh, political journalism, which is a, a parallel to sports journalism. I know this sounds stupid, but just bear with me. The parallel to sports journalism is the same because political journalism, uh, all they do is rely on press releases. So it's very, very rare that you see a, a, a kind of journalistic approach that goes after a particular issue or tries to uncover some kind of corruption or something like this. It's very, very rare. Uh, Quite often, they are just reproduced press releases, and that's it. And sports journalism is the same thing. So instead of looking at uh, uh, the tactics of particular sports and how one tactic fails or succeeds or something like that, they just reproduce treats, uh, tweets from uh, um, or, or, or take stuff from social media, uh, you know, Facebook sites from sports people, and that's all they do. So. I think the structure really works against tr trying to get involved in, in real proper debates. So, I mean, that's my, that's my view. Okay. <clears throat> Later on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Roland Peters. I'm a journalist uh, for NTV. Um, my question is, you, you've been talking about uh, how in the election process uh, you have um, yeah, a certain, certain way of uh, influencing it or escalating uh, in an election process and that this is, it's not about topics uh, anymore but it's just about escalating the situation. Um, and my question is why do you think uh, it is like that apart from the time of elections like in the normal uh, yeah, process of making laws and, you know, in the legislative uh, period. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, um, it is interesting that it seems so global and so pervasive, this, this process. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe people in general have become so disenfranchised by the places that they live in and the ways that they live that they don't interact with their politicians enough to demand things from them. I, I don't know. But it certainly looks that way. I mean, it certainly looks like, uh, even in non-election times, that none of these issues are pressed. And I, I don't see a solution to this. I'm quite troubled by it. Uh, but I don't see. I don't see a solution to it. Christian Reidel, President of Pirates Without Borders. Um, you say uh, you didn't see any solution. So my question is, um, do you think that the process, the politics can't control 
these processes is reversible or not? First question. Uh, and second question, if there, uh, you don't see any way, um, would you recommend uh, not to control these processes anymore, but to just to practice sabotage? Yeah, may, maybe. I mean, this is a uh, this is a, an important question because um, uh, I think Occupy tried to do some parts of Occupy tried to do this, and you know what? It, uh, again, this is really kind of a fascinating thing when you see parts of Occupy who are not engaging in sabotage, but uh, really just trying to obstruct the system. And I found it fascinating to see the. Uh, levels of violence that the state responded with. So I found it fascinating to see, really, are we there? You know, in, in 2011 and 12 and 13 and 14, are, are we really there where uh, a bunch of people in a liberal democracy will go and sit down in a square and you have to send the troops in? Uh, why? Why does this have to occur? Uh, it doesn't appear to be a threat to the state because that's not sabotage, right? That's not taking apart the state apparatus in any way. So I don't know, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to stand here and say I advocate sabotage because you know <laughs> <laughs> I'm being recorded. <laughs> so isn't this being streamed as well? I'm finished. <laughs> I'm yes. finished now. I'm done. Uh, uh, but there are different ways to do sabotage as well, right? So we don't have to talk about sabotage in this, in this kind of uh, uh, Bader-Meinhof way, right? Where we go and blow up a, uh, a shopping center and, and uh, uh, kidnap people. So, so I don't know. There, there are people in, in Australia, for example, who have advocated um, uh, destroying elections by, you know, destroying all the voting things in the elections. So en masse, they've advocated people standing in line and going into the line and just scribbling on the paper and throwing it in and then destroying the election. So this kind of sabotage. Uh, but I'm not sure how, how that will change anything. That, that's not a real act of, of you know, um, moving the state, which is this giant thing that uh, uh, can, can, has the capacity to react with violence. So, you know, I don't know. It's being live streamed. Maybe we need to talk about this uh, <laughs> somewhere else. Let's have a coffee later. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> My name is Christian Brandlub. I'm a data analyst, so I'm very deep in what you, what you just uh, explained. I think the situation is even more critical because uh, it's not just a a political thing, but it's also reinforced by economic developments. Mm. So for example, if you have insurance companies giving you rebates for giving you data where you travel, for example, yeah. Yeah, all these kinds of things, so you're getting economic uh, um, incentives here. Mm. Um, I think it's, uh, reinforcing that, that trend is, makes it even more difficult. Yeah, I, th I, I would agree. And, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, you started talking about this in the previous thing you started to you alluded to this a little bit um, the I find it fascinating that you can you can do these correlations uh, mathematically so I'm not so bad at math so I can see how how to do some of this stuff um, uh, and what I love is is this concept of the false positive right so uh, this is really fantastic isn't it so you can really create something that doesn't exist at all and you can create these false positives and uh, you find whatever the hell you want right Yes. You can't yeah. develop anything which doesn't happen. No, no. It, it's, it's a mathematical conclusion. So you can't ignore it. And when we put this into, into the security apparatus, well, I think we're finished. I think we're done. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> we're living the dystopia. Further questions? Ah, okay. Uh, so probably the last two ones because we're closing for the lunch break. Um, hello, my name is Björn Semrau. Um, you recently said that uh, politicians gave up on politics, and uh, I want to ask um, if, if it's so, uh, then are the politicians not um, irre irrelevant, or more than that, uh, dis dis destructive for the system? And can it be um, a method uh, for the future to get out of this dystopia 
to give up on politicians and to directly <laughs> make politics for ourselves in the state? Yes, yes, that's a, a very good, actually, you've, you've framed it better than, uh, than I would have. That's a very good answer to uh, a couple of the previous questions. Um, uh, I, I've, I've often said this, you know, as a kind of way out, lying or sort of ignoring, you know, I've got kids and I often tell them what to do, but they just ignore me and do whatever the hell they want anyway, right? <laughs> so I find this an interesting tactic to use. Uh, and, and eventually, as a parent, I will become irrelevant because they'll grow up and they'll move out and do, do whatever the hell they want to do. But maybe that's what we need to do, is to stop this kind of... Uh, uh, I mean, I said this before, and, and people got really angry with me when I called this. This uh, I basically said, liberal democracies are just one giant messiah complex. We, why do we wait for a leader to come in? What leader do I don't need a leader? Why do we need somebody to come in here and say, uh, this is where you're all going to go, and this is what you're all going to do? Well, I'm not sure I need that. And again, having spoken to some uh, politicians and policymakers. You know, they're idiots. I don't want them to, to claim some form of leadership. So I think you framed it quite well, that maybe that's what we need to do. We need to, uh, in many cases, in many instances, we just need to ignore the whole thing. Uh, I think that's what some of the Occupy movements tried to do. I actually think that's what they tried to do. They, they tried to take themselves out of that process in you know, not claiming the specific rights or not claiming the specific uh, uh, kinds of accesses to the state and then saying we want to do something different. It just The problem is, is it hasn't really worked very well. So, so I don't know. Again, I don't know. But I think you've, you've captured something there. Yeah, you've framed it quite well. Well, since I have the last question, I'm going to start by thanking you for giving us just a good prospects for pirates because we are advocating li liquid democracy, which is a way to combat uh, the uh, the old way of doing of, of leading a state of leading any kind of of, of sizable um, size of population or territory. So um, introducing more decision taken directly by the people who want to take them, not necessarily by the people who have the time to take them. So. Um, yeah, that's the point. And then going back to your research, I suppose you've analyzed data from several countries. Um, so my question would be, did you notice any kind of cultural differences? Because I would assume, being French, um, that this kind of hysteria re reaction to um, to, to, for example, to 9-11 was more, um, was quantifiably quantity-wise way bigger in the States or uh, Anglo-Saxon countries than in France because, for example, we are used to terrorism. Mm. I mean, France has had activities in the Middle East since ages. We know we have enemies there. We're used to them coming over and blowing things up. Um, and I think that you can see it from the reaction to Charlie Hebdo, which is, hasn't been history. So, um, I know, maybe you have some comments on this. Well, I think, uh, I think the, uh, this, is, uh, this is a long, you know, I could answer this in a very long answer, but I'll, I'll keep it as short as I can. Um, uh, I, I think terrorism itself as a modern uh, process, if I look at this as a political scientist, as a professional academic, as a modern process, ha has different uh, uh, styles and demarcations and various things like that. I mean, uh, nobody hijacks planes anymore, right? But they used to hijack planes all the time. So in the 70s, and, and this was the way to do it. Uh, um, so the, the construct of terrorism and the way that we think about political violence has changed. And, you know, sometimes we forget. Sometimes we, we uh, react in a different way. Um, I, I think that the media construct is a global one because um, a good example, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a brief example, and then I'll finish. I know you want to get out of here. <laughs> uh, um, a good example of this is to talk about the, um, there was a, uh, uh, an incident in Canada, in the Canadian Parliament, uh, a few months ago, where a single individual went into the Parliament and uh, tried to, you know, he was carrying a weapon and tried to shoot somebody and then he was shot down by the security eventually. Now, what I found really interesting is that immediately uh, large media outlets started with this rhetoric saying uh, Canada as a country has lost its innocence. 
And I found this amazing that people's historical memories were so short. So this is not the first time that the Canadian Parliament has been attacked. Uh, this is, you know, uh, Canada has had a long history of, of terrorism and terrorist movements internally. Um, uh, well before we had anything to do with, with uh, Islamic fundamentalism. So well before that, there was the FLQ that went on for a particular period of time. There were, uh, we can go all the way back to the, uh, to the Dukabors, who were a religious movement that uh, um, were sponsored to migrate out there at the turn of the century, you know, 100 years ago. And they, they had a, a specific idea about how they want to run their lives and then made a deal with the, the Canadian state. The state reneged on the deal, and then they had uh, a series of terrorist operations. They started bombings, and they, they did a bunch of uh, um, uh, naked protests. They would walk from one place to another, completely nude, uh, you know, kind of a long stretch of the, the roadway. So there's a long history of terrorism in the Canadian context. Um, quite violent people have died in many cases, you know, this sort of thing. And uh, the, but still, this this kind of media construct can't come up with anything better. I mean, all they had to do was Google the damn thing, right? <laughs> it's on Wikipedia. Just do it. It didn't even do that. Canada has lost its innocence. You know, this kind of a thing. So I think that uh, um, uh, there are there are national differences. Uh, there are territorial differences. It doesn't even have to be framed in this modern nation state way. There are territorial differences uh, in the way that, that this reaction went, but the way I see it is that I see that we are in a situation where uh, there seems to be this hegemonic kind of agreement about how to re respond and react to this. So in the Australian case, for example, uh, there really isn't this history of terrorism. There really isn't anything that, that we could claim, like the Canadian case, to have this history of terrorism and yet the reactions there, especially by the media construct and especially by uh, significant politicians, you know, political leaders, again, this leader concept, have been that same hegemonic historical reaction, uh, or a hysterical reaction, um, ignoring that Australia doesn't really have a problem with, with uh, terrorism. But I don't know why. Maybe they're desperate for relevance or they want to be part of the, you know, the bigger picture and they want to be attacked by terror. I don't know. But it's something like this. So anyway, that's, that's my response. So thank you again very much, Dr. Imre. Thanks.